people in the room are in love right now? Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, can you hear me in the back? Because nobody in the back seems to be in love. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So today's lecture is about love, and it's about how love became configured in the way that it is in our culture today. So that this video that you guys just saw strikes us as very odd, right? So this is a music video, a very popular one from Papua New Guinea. And it turns out this guy is, you know, he's in love with this girl. And, and you know, people fall in love all over the place, all over the world. But in a lot of places around the world, you don't get married for love. Oftentimes, uh, the marriage is actually arranged by your family and so on. So there's, there's big differences in how love is practiced around the world. And so what you saw there kind of strikes us as odd, right? Because all of us are really into love and we want to marry for love. And love is it for us. Like we are going to, we live our lives for love, right? So that kind of strikes us as odd. So last time we ended with this definition of marriage and the definition itself strikes us as a little odd and the reason why is because we had to expand it to accommodate all these different ideas about marriage throughout the world. So around the world, you know, there's oftentimes more than two people who get married, right? So you have polygyny and polyandry. So we had to include that in our definition. And then the other thing that might strike you as odd is that we go beyond saying that it's between the people involved and we actually say it's also we're talking about rights and obligations between them and their children and also between them and their in-laws and so we're actually talking about marriage worldwide we have to consider that a lot of times it's more about the families than it is about the two people um, I guess now might be a good time to say that my in-laws are here today along with my son Wilson <laughs> and my wife you want to stand up and this is this is uh, Wilson <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to talk about love today, and they're right there. So now and then I might get a little choked up and whatnot, but just bear with me. Um, so here we go. Uh, what you just saw, you saw this, this video, and I won't play it again, but you just see this little bit here. Okay, so here's the businessman coming in, and we hate this idea, right? That this businessman can come in and get the girl because he has all the money. This strikes us as, as very, like a, this strikes us as like buying and selling women, and we don't like that idea. Um, but I want to broaden this into cultural context here, and I'm going to reveal the, sort of the underlying bit of this, and you guys will be aware of this once you see it. That we're not just talking about buying and selling women. When you put it into a broader cultural context, you guys remember this comparison we did between gift, gift societies and consumerist societies. This is a society where the, the, the emphasis is not on the value of the product that's being exchanged. That's, there's not like a price on the, women, on the woman. Instead, the woman is uniting two families. And so that bride price is actually a way for one family, the man's family, to give a very large gift which is then distributed throughout the woman's family. So I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Um, this is in the field here. This is where I was working. This is... Uh, so here you see she, he's giving 102 items, things like machetes, clothes, and string bags. And now here's his wife, and she sits in the middle of... All the families have joined around, around her here. And I want you guys to note just how much wealth is in this pile. It won't look like a lot to you guys, but... In my estimation, it would be roughly maybe between 20 and 50 times what a typical person would ever own in their entire lifetime. So what has, been, what has happened here is that the, the guy who wants to marry this woman has gathered all these things and now the woman is actually presenting them to her family. And you'll see this is way too much than, than could go to one person. This is going to be distributed throughout all of her family lines. So now, you have to think about this now. Think about that web of relationships that we put up earlier. Think of the whole web of relationships of the man, and he's had to go to his entire web of relationships to get all these products, and now he puts them here. And look at all that wealth, and watch how it's distributed now to all these people. And the important thing about this is, the, this is not an exchange where it's just over now. What this is doing is it's uniting the two families. This isn't a payoff. This isn't, this isn't payment for the woman. This is the beginning of a gift exchange. And so in, in, in one way, it's almost like, imagine like the two, you get married and you come together for your first Christmas and both families are there and they exchange gifts. It's similar to that. It's that, that Christmas gifts are uniting people and 
and bringing them into one family. So that's what you see here. And so when we talk about bride price, it's not buying and selling women. It's actually bringing them into the exchange relationship. Now, in the textbook, you probably read about the contrast with dowry. And I'm going to bring that up because we see dowry, still today we see it in India, even though it's actually been uh, outlawed in India for quite some time now. But you'll still see it because the tradition uh, lasts. And the difference is that in the bride price or bride wealth situation, you have the man's family giving to the woman's family. In the dowry situation, you have the woman's family giving to the man's family. And these are in very different societies, so we have to put them in cultural context. And the first thing to point out is that the bride wealth is going to be common where women do most of the work. And when you go to New Guinea, you'll see that it's certainly the women who do most of the work. And horticultural societies worldwide tends to be uh, the women who do most of the work. Whereas a dowry is common where men do most of the work, so where you have maybe more intensive agriculture or pastoralism, you'll end up with a dowry situation. And then the bride wealth, as you saw in that short clip, is often exercised in egalitarian cultures, so that these gifts are distributed very broadly and everybody gets an equal share and so on. Whereas with a dowry, it often happens in stratified societies. And in India, where they have arranged marriages, they'll sometimes actually try to get a lot, of, a lot of money for the dowry so they can compete for a higher status man when they're going into the marriage. Now again, like this strikes us as odd again, right? We don't like to mix money and marriage. Love and, love and money should be stay, stay separate in our opinion. So I found this neat little video that kind of explains why uh, they would do an arranged marriage in India. And here's a, this is just a guy kind of explaining how parents explain it to their kids in India. this video because I think a lot of times we think of arranged marriage and we think that where's the love in that and he actually demonstrates that there is love in that and there's a couple really uh, good movies about this you can watch them for extra credit if you want one is Bend It Like Beckham the other one Monsoon Wedding and the cool thing about these movies is they show that India is you know kind of uh, going through transition right now or just they have a lot of tension right now in their society over some young people want to have love marriages and uh, other people want to have arranged marriages and so there's this tension in India and both of these uh, both of these movies do a really good job of illustrating that so you could watch that and just get it to uh, your TA before the next exam so that would be October 21st um, so there's two reasons why they do arranged marriage and, and they're very different than how we approach marriage and the one is um, so, so the one is, is just that, that, remember, this is more about the families than it is about the individuals. And then secondly, they say, you know, it's too important to leave up to love. 
Just think about like the whims of love and the trials of love and so on. And you'd have to admit, like, given all the trials and tribulations of love that all of us have been through, like, you just think about how hard it is just to find somebody and find somebody you love. Think of all the dating fiascos and so on we go through. Uh, it's really challenging. And, and, and so we put ourselves through a real gauntlet before we even find the one that we want, right? And my TA, one of my TAs uh, a couple years ago put together this little video to demonstrate this. Very, very simple little 15 second video. So there's this big question, right? How did we end up with this? Because arranged marriage, if you go back, say, a thousand years, most people on the planet would have been involved in arranged marriages. Love marriages would be very rare. And, and now all of a sudden, you know, we have love marriages everywhere and we think it's the norm. So how did it happen? What happened? What was the shift? And so I thought we'd dig into a little bit of history here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the 12th century. There's this famous story, Tristan and his old. And a lot of people say that our ideas about love are sort of encapsulated in this story. And it's the first story that really encapsulates our ideas about love. And then these, these, these ideas actually extend all the way, you know, eight centuries into the present. So you can take this, which is poetry from the 12th century, and compare it to poetry today. And what you'll see is a continuity about what love is all about to us. And the other thing that's interesting about this is it also has an interesting little insight into love and its association with marriage. Because this takes place during a time when arranged marriage was the norm and love marriage uh, just didn't happen. So what we're going to do here, um, this story, this is from the 12th century, it used to be told by troubadours who would walk around and they'd go from castle to castle and they'd entertain these kings and so on as they went, all the lords as they went around place to place. And this has also been made into a movie lately. Has anybody seen that? Tristan and his old. Okay, so there's a few people. And so I'm going to tell you the, uh, the, the version from the 12th century. And you'll see that it's, it's slightly different, but largely the same. So, and then I'm going to mix it with poetry from today. So we're going to have two poetries sort of going back and forth here. Two, two, uh, two different centuries, 800 years apart, illustrating these ideas about love. So here's how the story begins. Uh, this woman is about to give birth, and unfortunately, her, uh, the love of her life, who she, she's pregnant with, her child, has passed away. And as she gives birth, she is just heartbroken because the face of that child looks just like, um, just like her, her, the love of her life. And if you ever look at Wilson, like he's a little mini-me, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, and this was the case here, except that her, the love of her life had passed away, and she saw the face and she immediately passed away. She died of a broken heart, basically. And so this child was born an orphan, basically, no parents. And they named him Tristan, which means child of sadness. And so that's Tristan there on the left. So uh, Tristan was then raised by Lord Mark. So you have King Mark here, and he takes on Tristan uh, basically as a son. And so Tristan grows up with, with King Mark, but he's also an orphan. So he has a lowly status. While, but also living in a castle with King Mark. And there's, there's a big battle between Cornwall and Ireland during this time, 100 years of bloodshed during this time. And so they'd like to uh, somehow fix this situation. And they, it turns out that there's a tournament in which Isolde will be given away. Princess Isolde will be given away to the winner. And they think, well, if we can go over there and win this tournament, we could get... Um, is old over here in an arranged marriage, and that arranged marriage would end this hundred years of bloodshed. So they send Tristan over because Tristan is a great warrior, and he goes over there and he wins this tournament. And that's what you see here is that he's won the tournament, and now they're on the boat taking Is old back to King Mark so she can marry King Mark. But you guys know how these stories go, right? I mean, this story is Tristan and his old. It's called Tristan and his old because we know that they're going to fall in love. So there's a problem here. She's, a, she's arranged to be married to King Mark, but she's in love with Tristan. And the first thing I want to point out, and this is a theme that runs for 800 years, and I've been, already mentioned it several times today, and that is that status is not important when we're falling in love. Like, that's, that's key to it, right? So think about the notebook. And, right, so we, I was playing that as you guys came in a bit. This is a movie that some of us cry for like 
hours to, right? <laughs> and, and, and this is about, like, this is, think of the disparity in wealth that is central to that story. It's a classic story. It's in almost every Disney movie about love. I mean, this is classic, that status is not important. And we see it also in our poetry today. Um, this is dri- directly from the number one song last week. I don't know if you guys pay attention to the poetry uh, that comes over your radio, but this is the number one song last week. Um, it starts off, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no car to take you on a date. I can't even buy you flowers, but together we be the perfect soulmates. <laughs> See, I mean, this is, this is powerful stuff. And it's, no, notice, like, this is separating love and money. Love, money has nothing to do with love, right? And he says, talk to me, girl. Um, and, <laughs> and, the, and the girl says, oh, baby, it's all right now. You ain't got a flaunt for me. If we go touch, you can still touch my love. It's free. Uh, we can work through without the perks, just you and me. Work it out till we get it right. And then there's the chorus. And um, you guys are singing along in your head. Yes, it does get weird from there. Uh, <laughs> uh, just so you know, it's uh, baby, if you strip, you can get a tip because I like you just the way you are. <laughs> and I'm about to strip and I'm well equipped. Can you handle me the way I are? Um, <laughs> some deep and powerful messages. Um, but nonetheless, you see this connection, right? That, and, and you see it in lots of songs. So you go back to like, Maybe one of the top ten songs of the last 50 years would be um, Can't Buy Me Love, right? Um, I mean, it's all over the place. Uh, Ten years ago, J-Lo, you know, uh, My Love Don't Cost a Thing. It goes on and on. So almost every year I can have a new song for this class that matches this this thing. So here they are. They're um, they're not in love yet. We know that they're going to be in love. And what happens is they get thirsty on the boat. So here's Tristan and Isolde, they're on the boat, they get thirsty, and they see some, what they think is wine. But actually, it's a little special brew that uh, Isolde's nurse has prepared. And Isolde's nurse is, sort of knows things. She knows sort of magical potions and whatnot. And what she's created is a love potion, because she knows how difficult arranged marriages can be if there's not a connection right at the beginning. So she creates this love potion so that when she gets married, she'll drink it, and King Mark will drink it, and they'll be in love. So, but they find it on the boat, and they drink it, and they're in love. Okay, so this love potion gets them. And this is the second thing about love, which is kind of interesting. It's sudden and unexpected, and it acts on you, which is weird. Like, I, I want to point out just how weird this is. This is, in, in general, in our society, we like to think that we control things, that we make the choices, that we're the ones, we're the agents in our own life, right? But in fact, when it comes to love, we actually say, no, we fall into it. It happens to us. Cupid shot us with an arrow, and so on. And so this is uh, another, this is Gym Class Heroes, um, also very famous over the summer. And you'll notice the uh, poetry of this as well, I'm sure. We'll just watch the first 20 seconds here. And pay attention to the words here. This is poetry. Okay, so he's shot by Cupid. He's sort of falling in love, right? Isn't that beautiful? Pancakes? Okay, so that's the next thing there is leading into. He's, he, I mean, he's going nuts, right? Because like he's in love, and like he'd actually choose her over the sun, and then be one nocturnal son of a gun. Like, did you get that line? This is deep stuff. It's really powerful. Um, and and this is the next bit, right? So Tristan and Isolde have drank this potion, and now they are in it. I mean, they've fallen in. They're crazy in love, and that's the thing about love. It makes you crazy. Um, and so there's all these poet poems about this as well. So there's all this bit in this poem about like, how crazy in love they are. And it's really hard to express this kind of thing. Um, but here's, here's one attempt. This is probably the most famous attempt of the last five years. 
Um, this one is, is by the, poet, the great poet Beyonce. She's been... <laughs> um, this one goes like this. It says, Such a funny thing for me to try to explain how I'm feeling and my pride is the one to blame. Yeah, because I know I don't understand just how your love can do what no one else can. And then this is the really powerful part, I think. Um, she goes on and says, Got me looking so crazy right now. Your love's got me looking so crazy right now. <laughs> Your love got me looking so crazy right now. Your touch has got me looking so crazy right now. Your touch has got me hoping you page me right now. Your kiss has got me hoping you save me right now. Looking so crazy, your love's got me looking, got me looking so crazy, your love. I mean, that's awesome, right? Because not only is it, is it about the craziness of love, but it's also like fast-paced and crazy itself. And so it's, it's really interesting. So she invited Jay-Z, um, that's, uh, if you guys are taking notes, J-A-Y and then Z. Um, <laughs> uh, and she invited Jay-Z, one of probably our best poet of the last 10 years. And the reason why I say that, a lot of people don't know this, but Jay-Z doesn't write down anything. He'll step into the studio and you give him a topic and he just goes. Right? So they say, they bring him into the studio and they say, okay, the song is crazy in love. We're talking about love and how crazy it makes you and so on. Go. And here, this is what he says. He says, Young Hova, y'all know when the flow is loco. Young B and the ROC, uh-oh. OG big homie, the one and only. Stick bony, but the pockets are fat like Tony. Soprano, the rock handle, like Van Exel. I shake phonies, man, you can't get next to. A genuine article, I do not sing, though. I sling, though, if anything, I bling, yo. And what's interesting about this is that he hasn't said anything about love or anything about being crazy in love, right? Because it's so hard to, understand, it's hard to grasp. So here's our best poet, and he can't do it, right? Okay, so then this summer, another song comes out. And this is, again, like a lot of people really thought this was good poetry. Um, and, and still, I'm not sure how good it captures it, but we'll see how well he does here. And this song goes like, Hey there, Delilah. What's it like in New York City? I'm a thousand miles away, but girl, tonight you look so pretty. Yes, you do. Times Square can't shine as bright as you, I swear it's true. Uh, and then it goes on, this is the last, second to last verse, he says, Hey there Delilah, you be good and don't you miss me. Um, two more years and you'll be done with school and I'll be making history like I do. You know it's all because of you. We can do whatever we want to. Hey there Delilah, here's to you. And then this is I think the most powerful part. This is the end of the song. I think a lot, I, I looked this up on the internet and actually the lyrics aren't even transcribed. Um, so I had to go back through the song and get it down just exactly. Um, so it goes, oh, it's what you do to me. So here's trying to describe love. And he says, oh, it's what you do to me. And like the craziness of love, right? So, oh, it's what you do to me. Oh, it's what you do to me. What you do to me. Oh, and this is the, I think the really powerful part. Because this is like, this is like, okay, you're really trying to explain the, the power of love and the craziness of love. And he, he goes on, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, oh, this is a direct transcription, right? I mean, you don't, sometimes when it's sung, you don't get it, but, um, and then it ends, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. and, and so there's this real sense of, uh, that makes you crazy, but also there's the pain of love, right? It's weird that it would be painful, but this is what happens in this story, is that they've drunk this, this potion, and the nurse shows up, and she says, you have drunk your death, and Tristan looks at her, and he says, if by death you mean the agony of love, that is my life, and I accept that. And that's a pretty powerful statement, right? Because we all know that when you fall in love, you're in for it, right? It's like the agony of love. So every moment you're apart, there's this agony of love. Uh, just the agony goes on and on and on. So the, the next one thing to say would be that love is painful. And this has been expressed uh, recently very powerfully, I think. Um, this is just totally remarkable stuff. Um, Wilson's getting sad at this. He's heard this before. And he's, oh boy, this, this next poem is really deep. Um, so this one is all about the pain of love. It starts off, what is love? <laughs> Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> don't hurt me. <laughs> no more. <laughs> what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. What is love? Yeah. And then again, this is that, those powerful words again, talking about the pain of love. Whoa, 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 whoa. And you guys know how it goes. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, so you guys, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Wilson, Wilson is, he's really empathetic. So it's an amazing thing about babies is like when things get sad, he'll start to connect and he'll start crying. I'll try to be funny in a second. Um, <laughs> so, so you have this pain of love. This has also been expressed, and I, I didn't want to read these lyrics because I thought the, the power didn't really come through. So I thought I'd just play this here. Oh. Okay, so you watch here. All right, so he thinks he's in love, and then this is the next stage, right? All right, so that story goes on. I'm going to connect with that again later. We'll get, go back to that. And this is another one about pain. That's tough to take, right? Like that last line, like, I don't know what to do. It's like, I'll never be with you. So we all know that kind of pain. And now the other thing, you also notice, the, he mentioned angel, right? I saw an angel and so on. The, the last bit of this is really interesting. So Tristan and his old, they've just heard that they've drunk their death. And the nurse says, if by death you mean the agony of love, I accept that because that's my life. Okay, then he says, if by death you mean the suffering we will have to go through when we are discovered, I accept that too, because King Mark is not going to be easy on him, right? This is going to be bad news. And then finally, the third thing he says, and this is probably the most powerful one, he says, if by death you mean eternal damnation in the fires of hell, I accept that too. And now remember, this is 12th century. Uh, hell was very much, a very much a very real thing, like a very material, real thing to these people. So when he said that, he very much said, was saying, I know I'm going to burn in the etern in, in, for eternal damnation in the fires of hell. He said it, he knew that. And it, it is. It's tough. <laughs> and, and, uh, but he was okay with that um, because for him, love was divine. Like love had actually reached this point where it was competing with the divine. And uh, I was thinking of like what song to play here for this one. And it's actually not hard because there's all sorts of songs. They think about you two, love is a temple, love the higher love, love the higher law, love is a temple, and so on. Uh, there's all these analogies to like love being divine. But I wanted to, instead I thought I'd paint a picture for you. Like when I was in New Guinea, um, Sarah and I had lived there for about uh, nine months at the time. And then she left and she went back to the States. And so she was back in Topeka, Kansas, and I was there in New Guinea. We have no way of contacting each other. And I'm sitting there, just to give you a picture of what this is like. So we have no contact whatsoever. Um, I would listen to music now and then whenever I could, but the only music we have is coming through this little shortwave radio. And music only plays from about 6 to 7 a.m. every morning. And on Friday, you get pop music, and on Saturday, you get country music. And the rest of the week is bizarre sort of jazz, like, what's the right word? Fusion jazz, where it's just like... <laughs> and you just like, and it's not fun to listen to, right? So you only have these two hours a week of music, and um, so I was, and I would actually record it so that I could listen to it throughout the rest of the week. So I'd have like this one hour of music, I'd record it, and then I could listen to it the rest of the week, and I'll just play you something that came over the air. Then after I'd been there for about um, two months, and. Thank you. 
<laughs> so uh, that was like an amazing morning, obviously, you know, I mean, just like crying in the center of, in the middle of New Guinea rainforest, you know, <laughs> so you hear it. Um, good stuff. So, uh, so this love, like we get this sense that like when you guys are in love, right, you really do feel like it's elevated you somehow. Like you feel like a certain sense, like your spirit is elevated. And so in a certain sense, that's where this idea of like love being divine uh, is coming from. And it's interesting, you know, C.S. Lewis, who's uh, a really prominent scholar of Christianity, was looking back through the history of Christianity, and he said the most, sort of the, the, the biggest competition to the church from like the 12th century to the 16th century was love. Isn't that interesting? Like it wasn't anything else, but it was love. Because that's where people would put their faith in, in, this, in love rather than in, in God and so on. And so, and so that, that's what C.S. Lewis said was the greatest um, sort of threat to Christianity during that time. So now back to the story here. So Tristan and Isolde have drunk their, this stuff. They're madly in love. We've gone through all this, right? They have like this divine, powerful, painful, crazy love. This is what they've got right now. And they come back, and here's the thing, is that Isolde is still, you know, arranged to be married to King Mark. And she actually does marry King Mark. But her and Tristan are still madly in love. So they run around sort of behind the king's back, and, and they have all these trysts and so on. They meet it in the middle of the night, and they have all these uh, things going on. And this is actually portrayed well in the movie. So I thought I'd just play the, the trailer real quick, and you'll get a sense of what this looks like. So here's the thing, like as, as in love as they are, they never get married. And this is sort of the status quo for the day. Because during this time, like love is very much in the air. Like people talk about love and, and so on, but nobody is marrying for love. Marriages are arranged. They tend to always be arranged. And so she's, she's arranged to marry uh, King Mark, and she does. So then um, later, Tristan, get, they get found out. Tristan is sent away. And so Tristan is living far away, and he finds a wife, and, and they get married, and so on. But it's never the same, right? He still doesn't feel this, this love connection with this new woman, and she never feels the love connection with Mark. And so Tristan, uh, they go through life, you know, 40, 50 years, and suddenly Tristan falls ill, and he's lying there on his deathbed, and he's still thinking about his old, like the love of his life. And so he sends people out to go tell his old that he's about to die. And she... Uh, she, like, actually, it turns out she has a potion that can save his life. And so she hears this news and she's all happy because now she can come and save his life and they can live happily ever after. So the, the message that Tristan sends is, as you come back, if, if she is with you, sail with a white flag. If she's not with you, sail with a black flag. And so there he is on his deathbed, like, just about to die. And, 
they see the ship coming over the, the horizon. He can't see it because he's not at the window. But his old, uh, sorry, his wife, his new wife goes over and looks outside and she sees the ship coming over and it's a white flag. And she turns to Tristan and she says, I'm sorry, it's black. And he died right there of a broken heart. And sad story, right? <laughs> and uh, so he dies of a broken heart. As old comes, she has the potion to save his life and she sees he, that he's already passed away and then she also dies of a broken heart. So it's a sad story and, it, and it's interesting um, I think to us to think about you know why didn't they get married? Why you know it's such a different society where people could be arranged to be married and this powerful love cannot find itself to be in, in the, inside that marriage. So what happened then? So now today, the, the 12th century, that's the 12th century version of the story, right? But today we'd have a very different ending to that story. Think of a movie on, uh, based on the same premise. Um, it would probably twist that ending somehow, right? Um, because, because for us, love and marriage always go together. So what happened? So think about the 12th century. I'm going to take you on through to the 20th century and give you an explanation of how this happened. This is what's sometimes called a structural history because you're looking at the, the social structure and the cultural structure and how it changes over time. So the first thing that we have during this time is we have an increased division of labor. So from the 12th century on into the present, we have rapid technological developments. You have the printing press and so on. A number of things happen, and these things actually create more jobs, and people have increasing division of labor. Less people are working in the fields now as people um, uh, move into other occupations. This leads to an increase in market economy. Because remember, not everybody is growing their own food by any means, and so you need to go to a market in order to exchange for the things that you need to survive. So you have this growing market economy, a commodity culture, and this is a consumer culture where people have lots of choices, and so as this, this increases individualism, because you can now go to the market with your money, and it's your money that you earned, it's, you, know, you as an individual can operate alone, and you have lots of choices in front of you. So it's, just, it's increasing the sense of individualism. And then uh, this leads to two things. And this is interesting. I'll explain what that other word is in just a second. It might be the first time you've seen that. But it increases your sense of freedom because you have all this freedom of choice and so on. But also it increases what's sometimes called anomie. Anomie is this sense of like, it's almost like there's too many choices. It's not clear what the right path is. So you don't have a real sense of where you fit in or how to fit in and so on. And you get this sense of kind of being lost and kind of floating through the world. And a lot of us probably feel this. I mean, it's a pretty common feeling in today's society to just not quite feel like you're on the path, like you don't quite fit in and that kind of thing. And so there's a sense of anomi. And the thing about love is that it fits both of those. Love is a choice. It's like you go out there and you sort of, you can find somebody. You have the freedom to find the person that you want. But it also cures your anomie because when you find the one, you sort of feel like you're completed, right? That that person completes you and now you've found a place. And so that's where you get romantic love marriage emerging is that people are very mobile, they're very individualistic. And being mobile and individualistic, they're seeking out that person who can make them feel whole again and they end up with romantic love marriage. This starts to happen in the 17th century. So think of like, we're telling a story from the 12th century and there was love, but not love marriage. And now you get to the 17th century, and only then do you start to get love marriage. And the first place it happens is amongst the poor, and not the rich. So the rich are not doing this yet. And the reason why the poor are doing it is because they have nothing to lose. But if you're rich, then you have lot, the families want to maintain their wealth, and they want to make sure that wealth is not getting distributed um, in unfair ways to, and, and so on. So, they, so uh, they tend to still have arranged marriage. But you have romantic love marriage emerging in the 17th century. So this sense of like this freedom and anomie and this sense like that, that that one can make you whole has become so important in our lives. Like just think about this. Like when you were eight or nine years old, you probably could not actually experience the type of love that you can experience now, right? And the reason why you can experience love so deeply right now is because you guys have been through this gauntlet of adolescence where you felt sort of alone and out of place and so on. And now that actually allows you to feel the depth of love that you can feel today. And, and that's all, it's all somewhat cultural. You know, a lot of that comes out of, of our own uh, cultural context. So I wanted to show like one last little clip that illustrates this. This is uh, the most...
So this is the most popular video from 2006. And watch how these two people, they're very, in, they're most, they're very individualistic, right? They're mobile people living alone in a city and feeling alone. And look at how they, I mean, they literally complete each other, right? This is sort of the message throughout this. All right, so he comes with the umbrella, which reminded me of another famous poem of today. Um, <laughs> you don't want this one? <laughs> no, this is, I mean, sometimes you don't get it when you're listening you know, to, the, to the beat. You've got to listen to the words, right? So, when the sun shines, we'll shine together. Told you I'll be here forever. Said I'll always be your friend. Took an oath. I'm going to stick it out till the end. Now that it's raining more than ever, know that we still have each other. You can stand under my umbrella. You can stand under my umbrella. I mean, that's touching, you know, when you take it out of context. So, um, now the other thing I wanted to mention was, you notice like he comes in with that umbrella, right? Now, imagine they fall in love, right? They're in love and whatnot. They go through courtship, right? So think about the continuity here from the 12th century to the present, that story I told you. We still call it courtship. When he is madly in love with her and decides he wants to spend the rest of his life with, with her, he is going to, like, he'll do what? He'll actually approach her the same way he approaches his king, right? And this is courtship at its best, and you propose this way. This is the way you propose. And this, is, this has a direct line going back to the 12th century. So that, think of, like, the history there and how it's all connected. Um, so that, you know, we, in a sense, we still are the knight in shining armor when we go to propose um, to, to the woman we love and so on. So, so let's see how we, can, how we can bring this together now. I want to bring this back now to like the cultural context to, to summarize this. So this is what you saw for the structural history. And we see now love marriage being very, very prominent in our society. It's tied in with market economy, increased individualism and so on. And so when you look at this, you know, we can go back to the gift exchange metaphor versus the commodities um, idea. And you can see arranged marriage tends to happen in societies where they emphasize gift giving over commodities. And so like places like in Papua New Guinea. Um, and then the other thing that happens in love marriage is that this is kind of strange, but think about back in high school when you're really like struggling to find somebody and you really want to connect with somebody. The, generally the way, certainly the way I did it, and I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't true for 90% of the rest of you, even though you don't want to admit it, would be that you would approach this through what we call conspicuous consumption, meaning that you would go buy things and then show them off in hopes that people would think you were cool. And the only reason why you want to be cool is so that you can connect with somebody and fall in love, right? I mean, this is generally the thought process. This is how I did it. <laughs> and, and, and so, so, I mean, this, is, this idea of love marriage actually can, can facilitate this type of conspicuous consumption where people actually buy things to show off who they are as a person. This is how we show our identity. So we show it with the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the music we listen to. What we consume actually tells people who we are. And in that sense, we're hoping to connect with people. So think about a first date. What do you ask them? You ask them what kind of movies you like, what kind of music you like, and so on. In a sense, you're asking them what kinds of things do you consume. And we're trying to connect with them uh, because we want our identities to match up in some way. So back to, we ought to finish with this story here. You guys are dying to know how this ends, I'm sure. OK, so most popular song of the summer. And very interesting here at the end. Okay, so he's gone through all these tribulations. He falls in love several times. And then at the end, he's sitting here. I want to point something out. Notice where Cupid is. Okay, now he's falling in love again. He did not get shot with an arrow this time. This is what's important here.
She got the cutest laugh I ever heard. Now we can be her for three hours. Working out, we still cherish every moment. And when I start to feel my future, she's the main component. You call it wrong, call it wrong, call it wrong, or whatever you call it wrong. Again, he, he couldn't really label it, right? You can call it love, whatever you want to call it. And now he's walking. Cupid's about to shoot him. So, oh, nope, he's already in love. And Cupid sort of missed the boat here. He actually, <laughs> he actually made his own love, right? So whereas Cupid was trying to get him to fall in love, he actually made his own love. And, it <laughs> and now Cupid has the bug. Um, so, so, actually, I think there's actually like a deep message in this, in this video, right? And a lot of times we miss the deep messages in pop music. But the deeper message is here, he's saying, you know, like, we sort of let love take us over. And we let, like, you know, we're waiting to fall in love. And think about the metaphors. We talked about the metaphors we live by. Remember that book that we discussed a while ago? And the metaphor is that we fall in love. And, if, and the thing is, at the end of this video, we see him making love. And that's the real thing for him. Um, so it's just an invitation to sort of switch our metaphors around and think about it a little bit differently. So uh, that is love for today. Um, any questions about love? <laughs> so if you, if you, well, if you have it down, this is your quiz, uh, just to define love. And I'll leave you with scenes of the notebook to inspire you. <laughs>